All right, so thank you for having me as a discussant. I learned a lot by reading this paper. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and so this paper, uh, what are they doing? So what they're doing is they're trying to jointly estimate the decision to change your product price because there's nominal rigidities and prices don't change every month, then with the choice of what the new price should be. Uh, so they're they're using the Dubin and McFadden methods. So this is pretty standard in the IO literature, and they're applying it to this macro question. Then using this two-step approach, they're then going to estimate the pass-through of two different identified shocks. These are oil price shocks, specifically coming from oil supply shocks, uh, as well as firm-specific import costs to these item level prices. Uh, and then the last thing that they're going to do is they're going to study the synchronization of price changes in multi-product firms. Uh, so we know that multi-product firms are going to have different pricing dynamics than single product firms. Uh, and this might mute the price response to aggregate shocks. So what are they going to find? Well, they're going to find that the selection bias, that is, who is changing their price, statistically matters for the extensive margin of price adjustment. So it's going to show up uh, statistically significant. However, if we compare uh, their fairly complicated method to just simple OLS, we're going to find that it's not necessarily economically relevant for these pass-through measures. Uh, so sometimes just doing something simple is going to get us most of the way there. So what are they going to find? Uh, they're going to find that import price pass-through is immediate so immediately there's going to be passed through of around 30 percent uh, and it's going to be persistent so it's going to last over two years although it's going to fall to around 20 percent while looking at this other type of shock the oil uh, price uh, pass through is going to be gradual uh, and it's actually going to have larger pass through in the medium run so it's going to have zero pass through immediately and after about a year and a half it's gonna have complete pass-through. Then what they do is, particularly with the oil price pass-through, they're then going to look at who has high oil price pass-through, and they're going to find the intermediate goods rather than final goods are going to have stronger pass-through, as well as those industries that are more exposed to oil inputs as we would expect. All right, so what do I love about this paper? Well, I really love the new data that they're bringing to this question. So they're some of the first to use this da the Danish uh, PPI item level pricing data that they then do a very good job matching it with other administrative sources to these firm level outcomes. Uh, so they're gonna match it to firm level accounting outcomes. Uh, they're going to have monthly level uh, payroll payrolls as well as well as using input output tables to get exposure to the energy sector. So another thing that I like then is this careful empirical identification of shocks. So in both of these two shocks, they're going to use kind of a shift share instrument uh, identification procedure where they use some pre-existing exposure to the shock. So in both, so from the energy, this is gonna come from the energy that you used previously, as well as in the in, uh, import uh, uh, usage. And then we're going to look at the change in costs that period. So this is gonna be more exogenous than if we just looked at the change that period. And then they're going to use this appropriate method to disentangle this extensive margin of change in your price, where there could potentially be high selection with the intensive motive on the uh, pass through methodology. And then the last thing that I like is they're studying a very important question. So they're studying the intensive margin that is the decision to change prices in response to these identified shocks, as well as synchronization of these price changes. Uh, so in some work that I'm doing, we find that price change frequency and pro probably synchronization are much more closely linked to monetary non-neutrality and identified monetary shocks, then higher order moments of the price distribution. So I think that this is the right path to go down. Uh, so what do I wanna learn more about after reading this paper? Well, I want to learn what is different about these firm level import costs and the energy uh, costs 
that they have very different pass through, both in level uh, as well as in shape. Uh, so on the left here, uh, I just grabbed the import cost shock. Uh, so we see that it's highly persistent, uh, though it does degrade a little bit over about two years. And then the oil price shock, specifically the oil price supply shock, uh, which we also see is highly persistent. So these are potentially random walks, both highly persistent. And so we might expect that the pass through should look similar to these two shocks. Instead, what we find is that again, both in the level and in the shape, the pass through is very different. So on the left, we have the import cost pass through. So we have fairly high immediate import cost, cost pass through, but then it falls over time. So it's not maybe surprising that there is import cost pass through on impact, but what's surprising is that it falls over time. And this is surprising re uh, relative to the oil price pass through, which has completely opposite dynamics. There is no pass through on impact, but then after about a year and a half, we're going to have complete pass through. So one thing I want to know is why is there this difference between these two types of shocks when the underlying shocks exhibit the same dynamics? Um, my guess might be is just the share that these firms use in the two shocks. Uh, so Gabriel showed that the oil price, the share is much smaller. Uh, in terms of cost share than the import costs. And so this might uh, be some state dependence on these underlying uh, cost changes. What else do I wanna know about? Well, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the data. So they're gonna have the data to identify these effects. So I wanna know do durable and non-durable industries have the same response? Uh, because we're thinking about monetary non-neutrality, we know that durable goods matter most for monetary policy uh, and price stickiness. And so it should be pretty simple to just estimate this for the two different sectors. Uh, and then another one is, so we're looking at import, import cost shocks and oil price shocks. What is the implication of other shocks for price and behavior? So in particular, I'm thinking about financial shocks here. We know that during the financial crisis in the US, Financial shocks led some, uh, so led, led some firms to raise their prices in order to build up cash flow and other firms to de decrease prices in order to build up market share. Uh, there's probably gonna be some financial shock that you can use as well to see if this matters for pass through during this time period. Uh, and then kind of extra, this is somewhat outside of the scope of what you're doing, but what sticky pricing model would align with these results? It's not clear to me that it's going to be a Calvo model or a menu cost model. All right, so what I wanna talk about now is why this is an important question and why synchronization matters. Uh, so the type and nature of nominal rigidity in the data is going to determine monetary net neutrality. So let's just look at this very simple general pricing model. So firms indexed by Z are going to choose a price PTZ to maximize future expected profit. They're gonna have downward sloping demand curve and they're gonna fulfill all demand at their posted price. So these firms like they have in the data, they're gonna have a wage bill, maybe an import cost bill. They're gonna have an oil bill. So QT is the price of oil and OT is the demand for oil. Uh, but then kind of importantly on this first stage is that there's going to be a nominal rigidity, which is chi TZ. So if you change your price, PTZ, you're going to have to pay some menu cost or face some nominal rigidity. So in the two extremes, we're gonna have this Golisov and Lucas style menu cost model, where then all firms at all times can change their price, but they're gonna have to pay a, a small menu cost, CHI. And so in this type of model, it's going to give rise to an SS type rule where uh, so if you receive shocks that are large enough, you're pushed outside of these, these SS bands and you're going to change your price because it needs to change. So in this type of model, there's going to be very high selection. And so those prices that most need to change well. And so in response to a shock, we should see a very large price response and a relatively muted output response. 
But at the other end of the spectrum, which we can uh, encapsulate in this chi TZ, is the Calvo style model. So in the Calvo style model, you're going to face anomalous rigidity, which is equal to zero with probability alpha. So the Calvo ferry taps your firm and says you get to change one or maybe multiple prices for free. But then everyone else cannot change their prices with probability one minus alpha. So in this, in this style of model, price changes are purely random, thus there's no selection. So if we had pure Calvo pricing, we wouldn't have to necessarily estimate this two-step model. Uh, but again, we think probably in the data, we're somewhere in between these two models. So this pricing model can have no selection with the Calvo or pure selection with the menu, menu cost. And looking at frequency of price change by itself does not tell us anything about which model is closer to the data. And so what's typically done in the micropricing literature is we're not going to estimate a fancy model like DKZ have done. Instead, we're just gonna look at the steady state price distribution uh, and calibrate or estimate the model to that. So Golosov and Lucas, they have two parameters, so they're gonna match frequency and average size. And this somehow tells us about the underlying distribution of shops. So what do DKZ do in this paper? Well, they're just going to directly estimate this. Uh, what causes prices to change? And then secondly, by how much will they change those, those prices? So this methodology directly speaks to what is causing these price changes, which is really nice, as well as they have these underlying shots. So we can then disentangle what these two types of shocks are doing, these more idiosyncratic firm shocks and the more common oil price shocks, uh, as well as look at the behavior of synchronized price changes. And we can use these to inform the modeling efforts. So this can tell us what type of nominal rigidity actually exists in, in the data. And then this, the, the second uh, thing that, that this methodology gives us is that it's corrects for the selection bias in the pass through estimate, uh, which is very nice. Uh, so this is why synchronization is going to matter here uh, and why it's so important uh, that they're directly looking at these shocks. So a couple of comments then on what else I'd like to see. Uh, is so when they do the first stage, the extensive margin of price adjustment, uh, they're going to get this first stage estimate. So they're going to estimate a multinomial logit uh, where you either increase your price, which is the indicator one, you keep your price fixed, or you decre decrease your price. So they're going to control for the cost shocks, the uh, firm level cost shock and the oil shock, competitors inflation, the share of positive and negative price changes at both the firm and the industry level, firm level costs, sales, employees, aggregate monthly inflation, and the exchange rate. Uh, but I think that they're missing kind of a key variable here, which is going to be correlated with synchronization, and that's this heterogeneity in price change frequency. So we know that there's tremendous heterogeneity in price setting behavior across industries. Uh, so Think of something like the oil industry, which changes prices every day or every week, relative to something that's more retail, like the grocery store, which might uh, only change every six months. So these higher frequency industries are likely to be more synchronous. Uh, and so I think we need to control for that here. Uh, and so what I've done here is, so I don't have access to the, the Danish data, uh, but looking at the US data, so excluding the oil industries, which have a monthly price change frequency of over 0.9, we see that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the price change frequency. So this is around the same level of aggregation that they're using. Uh, but you know, if your industry changes price prices 50% of the time, then every two months you're changing prices. And it's very likely that we're going to just mechanically see synchronized price changes. Whereas down here, uh, around the average, uh, around 0.1, it would be much less likely to just mechanically see the synchronization. Uh, so a simple fix, just control for the absolute level of price change frequency to see if these results are due to synchronization or price flexibility. Uh, of course, there's a couple of ways to do this, firm fixed effects, industry fixed effects, or the actual price change frequency. The second comment I have 
uh, is that I think they are using the appropriate data for this question. So they're using this item level PPI data from Denmark. This is entirely appropriate to use because these are firms that produce and then set their prices. Uh, and in comparison to the CPI outlets, uh, which sell other firms goods, these firms are likely to have pricing power. Uh, so this is going to be important when we're thinking about nominal rigidities. Excuse me, this sorry, Mike. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, we're, we're, we don't have time left, so if you can be brief. Yeah, okay, uh, so I think it's great, uh, but in the regression, control for aggregate PPI rather than CPI, because they're not as correlated uh, as we would like, only around 0.26. So overall, I thought it was a great paper. I really enjoyed it, and I think the authors are uh, on the, the right track. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, so, Gabriel, do you want to uh, react uh, like five minutes, and then we can uh, collect the paper uh, question from the audience? Yes, I'm, I'm going to try and be brief. So, thanks a lot for uh, a careful discussion. Um, and uh, you hit the nail when you said that we need to understand what exactly is different about these two shocks that we that we looked at. Um, so, things that we that we know are different across those two, um, and therefore offer potential explanations, is that. Um, the first one, the energy price shock, is much more uh, common across firms than the import one. So, I mean, when we estimate the pass through of the energy cost, we do interact it with a firm level share variable, but this share variable is typically very low for most firms. So it doesn't vary that much. So most of what most of the response that we're picking up is is this common. Um, this common uh, the fact that it's common across firms in the entire economy. Um, and then on top of so on top of that, it has this problem that there are some there might be some general equilibrium effects which we cannot pick up um, in in these kinds of local projections. So we've we've done a lot to address um, to see why this increase after the oil price shock is so gradual. And I showed you some of it with like uh, intermediate goods and um, this, this pipeline exposure, but still we see some delay in the beginning, but it's definitely something that we will look at uh, more. Then durable versus non-durable, I think we can do that or we can disentangle those in the data so that we'll definitely do that. And um, that's very good. Um, about financial shocks, um, I think this this is certainly a good idea, an interesting question. I think it would be a little um, so in terms of the estimate the, the regression that we estimate, we really have we want to have a cost measure on the right hand side, and a financial shock is not necessarily uh, only a only a cost um, component. It has more to do with cash flow, so that's why it's uh, we haven't really focused on that yet, but maybe we'll think about it. Um, pricing model, you're right, it's uh, probably somewhere in between a Calvo and a menu cost model. Um, certainly neither um, pure of those two, um, but some, yeah something where organization plays a large role uh, for sure. Um, and then the last two comments that you made um, about sectoral heterogeneity, we do have a, a sectoral fixed or a sectoral dummy in the in the first stage. So we do control for it. We don't really exploit the fact that some sectors have higher adjustment probabilities than others, but we do control for it. And we also have the uh, the sort of uh, volatility of price changes in a five-year window prior to the data point um, as a control. So I think we should pick up uh, some of this uh, heterogeneity that you mentioned in terms that that certain sectors just 
are more flexible than others. So I, but we will also play around with um, fixed effects and, and combinations of fixed effect. And last but not least, the fact that we used the CPI instead of the PPI had to do with the fact that we started off replicating a paper that used the CPI um, and then we kept it. Um, but we should definitely check if, but I'm fairly confident that the results with the PPI would look very similar. Okay, great. So we have a question from uh, Federico Neus. Um, Francisco, can you open the microphone? Okay, give me a second. Okay, Federico. Hi, Gabriel. Thanks for the talk. Um, so, so I have two two small questions. I'm I'm sorry if I missed some of this during your presentation. The one thing, the first thing is that when you define the shares of the of the shocks, sort of of the shift share shocks, um, I was wondering whether you could use some of the data and some of the new methods that have been developed by Amil Petrine and co-authors to estimate these uh, sort of a sh a cost shares at the product firm level rather than at the firm level. So you would sort of be able to get at what share of imports, uh, you know, are used by different products within the firm. So generally the data doesn't have that level of, of, of details, but uh, I mean, Petrin and co-authors have developed a way of sort of figuring out how to get those shares by using sort of an, an extension to product function and estimation techniques. So I was wondering, and I think they did that for Belgium. So, so I was wondering whether you can do that for Denmark data and also apply those. And maybe, I mean, it's, it's, I, I think it's gonna be interesting because then you can think for multi-product firms, whether there's a role for cannibalization and price adjustments within the firm across products. That's one thing. And then the second thing, I might have missed this also, but given the persistence of the shock it seems to me that you would need to adjust at least the standard errors of the of the sort of local projection uh, regression um, there's a paper from andrew levchenko estimating trade elasticities where they develop sort of and they show how different it is once you adjust these local projections uh, with the persistence of the shock that you're using. And you might have been doing this already, but I was curious whether it was the case or not. And sometimes these adjustments are kind of important. Yeah, thanks a lot. So the first comment about cost at the product firm level, uh, which we do not observe, uh, is definitely something that I wasn't aware um, of this, but that's definitely a very good input that we will look into. Thanks. And the standard errors are adjusted for the uncertainty in the first step of the estimation, but not for the persistence of the shock itself. Um, so that's also something that we, that we can look into. Yeah, in, the, in, this, in this paper that I mentioned, I mean, it's 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 really easy to do uh, and, and sort of simple. So I think uh, you can just apply those methods um, here. I think. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, um, now Luciana Juvenal has a question. Francisco. Okay. Luciana, you are on. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So, very nice presentation, Gabriel. So, I think it's good when you identify the shocks to isolate them from the Danish demand conditions, so to speak. Uh, but I wondered if your identification is really narrowing down the old shock to another supply shock. And we know from earlier literature, starting with Killian, but also others, that all price fluctuations are largely driven by the so-called global demand shock. So I wondered if you aren't missing an important driver of oil prices by focusing on an oil supply shock. Um, you mean that it would be more interesting to look at another type of shock, or do you mean that we should control somehow? Because as as long as 
uh, the demand is not different for firms with um, high energy shares versus low energy shares, that should not be of concern, right? Where we well, have. But, but what I mean is, you're controlling a foreign oil supply shock, right? But if the determinant of, I mean, it's going to look very different. Um, and this is this doesn't depend on the business cycle of, of Denmark. When you talk about global demand shocks, you think about uh, so when this literature started was China and India growing very at a very high speed and demanding more of all commodities, including oil, but others. And if this is the main driver of oil prices and not oil supply shock, I'm I'm wondering if you're not missing a very important factor that drives oil prices. I don't know if it is more interesting to look uh, demand or supply. I'm just wondering if you're really capturing, uh, to the greatest extent, the oil supply or the oil shock. I mean, we 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 are fairly. Um, we simply take the oil supply shock from this um, Baumeister Hamilton paper, which actually finds that oil price fluctuation is is largely driven by changes in oil supply um, but I and then use it as a as a way of as a shifter of cost so we're not we're not really interested in in looking at oil demand of of Danish firms in that sense I'm not sure if I understand it correctly but Okay, so uh, we have a question from Rob Bigson. Francisco, can you open the microphone? Okay, uh, sure. Rob. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Yes. Great. Uh, yes. So, yeah, a, couple, a few questions. Very interesting work, great paper. Uh, just, yeah, one thing I didn't catch, and you know, maybe it's the, the web view, view of things, but how did you handle exit? I didn't see that. And I'll just give you the other questions I, I wonder too. And, uh, you know, for the import costs, I wonder if there's an issue about the ability to substitute towards other inputs. Whereas you could imagine that, you know, for energy, well, you need energy. But for, uh, you know, if you're buying from one source versus another source, that might actually change. And you might switch to a domestic good or something like that. And then I, th I guess my third question is, like, thinking about the selection criteria, does it generate, I guess when you're talking about the pass-through, you're reporting what firms that do conditional on changing, you're reporting the, the, the how much they change. So it's sort of like the overall pass through would be con, con, the, that probability times the result. Is that right? I'm, I'm a little, because uh, otherwise you'd imagine there'd be this sort of nonlinearity in the results for like the aggregate, you know, how much the price index would change. And I think that might be something to help people guide through is how much the firm's prices are changed versus the overall price index. All right, thanks. Okay, so the first question was about exit of firms. If I-, I uh, Are exit of firms or products? Them. Or products. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's not something that we that we look at. Actually, most of the, most of the goods we are we observe for almost the entire uh, time spell. So I wouldn't expect results to be any different if we looked at some kind of um, endogenous exit um, sure. of those goods, to be honest. Um, substitution to other imports or um, domestic goods, that's something that we should address. That's true. Um, um, yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. And then uh, in terms of the aggregate, so we're, we're mostly interested in the structural pass-through of the firm, right? But we should probably, and we, and we see that the nominal rigidities don't matter that much. Um, so we can theoretically add it up to some kind of aggregate index. Yeah. Um, although we haven't thought about this, um, in, I think that's where the selection criteria would really kick feet. in. Would we would sort of tell you something interesting, because mm -hmm. that's gonna because it's gonna be oh 
Yeah, firms change it. If they change their price, they're changing it by whatever your numbers were 0.4 or something. And then, but the selection would say, oh, yeah, all of them change or none of them change. Some, and then, then, too, I think you do get a nonlinear for the index if you're sort of making the, the pricing decision more uh, endogenous. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Thank you so much.